Well, the uh, part of the scripture that I want to focus on today is there in Galatians 6. Galatians 6. So take your Bibles and uh, just make sure they're in Galatians 6. And uh, we're in Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap, reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Therefore, uh, the title of my message today is, We Shall Reap If We Faint Not. And, you know, the, it's really a tough message to just focus on the reaping without talking about the sowing and the harvesting and what it takes to reap. But the big po the, the point that I want to make, and we're going to go through all of that, that, this is actually a lengthy message and it's got a lot of uh, scripture that we're going to cover, is that we shall reap if we faint not. And that's the challenge with uh, society today, with the challenges that we're facing, is that no matter what we do, uh, we, we have a tendency to want to give up. You know, the world is doom and gloom. There's a lot of negativity out there. People are set in their comfort. They're either apathetic and they're not uh, out there trying to do the work of the Lord. As a matter of fact, I know for a fact that this week, uh, I believe, is the start of football season. And so most people are being already uh, weary and they're fainting because they're putting their time and effort into something that doesn't lead to any spiritual productivity. But we're not going to, but, but we're not, gonna, the message is not on the NFL and why you shouldn't watch sports and what a waste of time it is. The message is on why, why we shall reap if we faint not. But what does it take for us to reap? Well, we have to have certain things into place for us to reap. We have to do certain work. There's got to be a foundation set. And there's got to be certain steps that we there needs to be taken in order for the reaping to come. And I'm talking about the reaping us uh, spiritually of the, the seeds that have been planted. But the Bible also speaks of reaping as, uh, you know, at the end time when the angels will come and reap. And they'll uh, throw the, the bad into the furnace and then keep the good. But that's not what we're going to focus on today. And actually, before we get started, let's go ahead and also fit, look at verse 10 of Galatians 6. And it says, And we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So when the Bible is telling us to, that we shall uh, reap if we faint not, it says also that if we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. So it's not just... You know, we, we have a soul winning heart. It's not just when we're going out into the highways and the hedges, but also for us to do the work with our brothers and sisters and to build them up and to edify them and to help them grow and to allow them to help us to grow. But uh, let's, let's, take a, let's slow this down and let's take a look at a couple of things. So if the first things I want to do is just kind of define a couple of terms. The reason that I'm doing this is uh, even though sowing and reaping is a concept that is very consistent in a biblical church, and if you turn through the pages, you're going to find them from Genesis all the way to Revelation, this concept of sowing and reaping, we, we have not, most of us, our generations have not grow up, have not grown up farming, we've not grown up on uh, the ranch, we've not grown up working uh, by the toil of our hands. As a matter of fact, you know, most of the work that, that I do is behind a desk or behind a computer or, uh, you know, other than when we go out there soul winning and we're walking and knocking and reading the Word of God. But so we've got to understand what these terms are. And, and some of them will be very basic. You're like, Pastor, why are you going over this? Well, it's just make sure that we have the basics covered. You know, if we don't understand the, the basic concepts of things, then that's how things can get taken out of context. And I want to make sure that, that we know what we're discussing. And, and it's, it's always better to break things down to the ridiculous. And if this is a repetitive uh, set of terms or if you have already know the definitions, well, then just take it as an opportunity to relearn them and re-strengthen what you already know because repetition is the mother of learning. So it's always a good thing to remind yourself of things that you already know. But, uh, you know, let's just look. What does the term sowing mean? Well, sowing is a uh, participle present tense, and it means to scatter a seed. Sprinkling with seed is ground, stocking with seed. You know, the act of scattering seed for propagation or for growth. And so when we're sowing, 
what we're doing is we're scattering the seed, and it reminds me of Isaiah 55, where God says that His Word will not return them void. And so when we're out there sowing, we are out there sowing the Word of God. But this, this term sowing can also be, and I'm going to show you here in the Bible, that even the devil sows. So it's not just that you know, we want to speak on the Bible and what, the, what it says about sowing and reaping, but we ought to understand that everything that we do, we're always sowing or scattering seeds to be able to reap. And the Bible tells us that, you know, let's just look at uh, verses 7 and verses 8 of Galatians. It says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In other words, we can lie to ourselves, but God knows the truth. He says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So, what is it that we're going to sow in our lives? And that also leads to why I'm talking about we shall reap if we faint not, because sowing is work. Either, even if we're sowing evil work, we're doing some work. And the, the world has a tendency to uh, think that you can solve all problems by yourself. It's that self-help attitude. You know, you can go online today and you can just type self-help and you're going to find everything from a Zig Ziglar to a Grant Cardone to a uh, Tony Robbins to all of these. And the reason I know them so well is because I spent a good portion of my youth, my, my adult years, uh, listening to these guys as I was in the sales industry and I was in the banking industry and uh, financial services. And, you know, you want to be able to self-help. The challenge is that you will burn out. You will faint. You know, the Bible gives us good foundation on how not to faint and what we need to do so that we faint not, so that we're able to reap those rewards, right? So sowing is a very important part. And, you know, if you've ever farmed, then it would make sense. You know, there's a lot of, you have to plow the field, you have to till the land, and then you have to prepare it so that you can spare, you know, sparingly sow the seed or plant the seed, right? Then the harvest is, uh, it's, it's usually used as a noun, but it can also be a verb, uh, transitive verb and uh, you know the couple of definitions I'm not going to go into all of them but it's the season of reaping so reaping is different than harvesting right and it's gathering uh, corn or other crops it especially refers to the time of collecting corn or grain which is the chief food of men as wheat and rye uh, wheat and rye uh, the ripe corn or grain collected in secured barn or stacks the harvest this year uh, oh, that's just an example the product of labor the fruit of fruits, you know. So it's the labor, it's the product of the work that we put in. Now there's certain factors when you're sowing or when you're farming or you're going to harvest. Is you know even if you put in the work, there's not always going to be that reward. You know there's factors that are out of our control. But we're not going to focus on the factors that are in control. We're going to focus on what the Lord has asked us, which is the work. He's going to take care of the rest, right? And so the harvest is just the product of the labor. Uh, in scripture, harvest signifies figuratively the proper season for business. Well, what business is it talking about? In the scripture, it's talking about our father's business. You know, it's doing the first works. It's doing the first love. You know, it's, uh, it's to reap or gather ripe corns and other fruits to use them for man's meat. So that leads me to reaping. Reaping is a transitive verb. And usually it has to do with the sickle. And it's to cut the grain with a sickle or to reap wheat. It's to clear the crop by reaping, uh, uh, to reap the field, to gather, obtain, or receive a reward as the fruit of a labor and works in good or bad sense, to reap a benefit from exertion. In other words, you're working to perform the act of operating or reaping uh, to receive the fruit of the labor of that works. In other words, what they would do is if the harvest was ready, you'd go and reap. You'd go with a sickle and you get the, 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 uh, the harvest ready to be taken up. You'd have to clean up the, the harvest, basically. And then the gleaning, and we're not really going to speak on gleaning, but it's good to understand gleaning in the Bible is what was left over. So, you know, if you went into the field, even if you did with a machine or people, stuff's going to fall to the side or it's going to be left behind. You might leave a, 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 a section. And what you do is if, you know, you would go and glean the field, meaning you'd make sure you clean it up and, and, and pick up everything. So those are the terms for farming. And, and obviously, any good farmer or anybody who's worked in the field probably knows that, that, that I took this from the definitions and from little experience. 
you know, I'm not an expert in this. this is not, I've not spent time farming. I, I've never owned a farm. I've never worked on a farm. You know, I've done manual labor in the sense of worked around the house when I was growing up. My, my parents had chores for me. The best that I did was I did at one point uh, plant a lot of rose bushes and trees, and, and uh, I took care of that. But I never uh, used any of that fruit for nourishment. It was just for show. So there's a big difference. But, uh, you know, I wanted to do that because... Uh, if we note here, God told us that while we were on the earth, certain things would remain, right? And so we can spiritually expect to always have the, the harvest, the sowing, the reaping, and the gleaning. And, and I, I took those out of order, but you can, we know for a fact that in life, till the time of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, there will always be an opportunity to sow, there will always be an opportunity to harvest. There will always be an opportunity to reap. And there will always be an opportunity to glean. And the challenge is that uh, right now in, in society, we just have contemporary Christianity or false doctrines creeping in where they've kind of used these false doctrines, especially, you know, of the rapture or of, uh, you know, a lighter message or a more updated message to give you an excuse to not do the work of the Lord, to not do the things that you need to do for whatever reason they give you. I mean, the, the most common reason that I can think of is because, well, you know, we're not going to be here for that part, so why not do, we, I don't have to do that. The Lord's going to take care of that. Well, but the Lord is going to take care of it by sending His workers. And before I even get into all the points of Scripture that I have and all the points on sowing and reaping and why we shouldn't faint so that we can reap, and after what we've sowed is uh, let's just turn your uh, Bibles there to Genesis 8 you know and, I, and uh, I'm excited about a message like this it's nothing new uh, there's nothing new in your son I just I it, it's a good message for anybody who knows that you, you're constantly working and sometimes you see results and then you don't always see the results you think you're gonna see but you got to know that behind the scenes God's working a work but he expects you not to faint so that you can reap those rewards so you can reap those rewards, whether it's here on earth or in heaven. But before we do that, go to Genesis 8. And in, uh, in uh, verse 20, it says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. This is after you know he had come out of the ark. And took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. And this is the, the verse that I want to focus on is verse 22 says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So the Bible is there. We can have a spiritual application that the Bible is telling us that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, or we can interpose sowing and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, so now seas. In other words, while the earth remaineth, there's work to be done. There's going to be seasons. There's, there, there's things that need to get accomplished. And so what's the first point that I want to make? Is The first point is that before we can get to reaping and we can, we can focus on not fainting, let's look at what it is that we're sowing. You know, we shall reap what we sow. In other words, we shall reap what we sow. You say, well, Pastor, that, that makes sense. Well, apparently not. Because if, if, we, if we reap what we sow, and it's such a simple concept, we wouldn't have, a, like, for example, the theory of evolution where people think that we can come from a primordial soup into something because its own kind produces its own kind, right? And if we're talking about farming, obviously, if I plant an apple seed, I'm not going to get corn stalks. And if I plant corn stalks, I'm not going to get apple seeds. Well, when it comes to the spiritual things, if I plant sound doctrine, we should get back sound doctrine. If I plant false doctrines, well, then we're going to get back false doctrines, right? So we shall, sh so us as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians that want to go out there and spread the message of Christ and do the work of the Lord, what's one of the things that we're going to sow? We shall sow Jesus Christ or the message of Jesus Christ. And if you'll turn there to Matthew 9, Turn to Matthew 9 in your Bibles over to Matthew 9 and verse 35. I'll show you that this is a, a you know, where, where the Bible tells us that this is what we need to be doing. 
Matthew 5, verse 35 through 38, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So Jesus was leading us by example in soul winning. It says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad, as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So Jesus was sent, you know, he came into the world not to condemn it, right? He came into the world to save it. He came into the world to show them. He came to sacrifice, you know, his body. He died on the cross. He was buried for three days and three nights. He was raised from the dead. And now he sits at the right hand of, uh, of the God the Father. And it says that he went about doing it. And then his heart, it says there in verse 37, then he said unto his disciples, the heart, I mean, before that, uh, verse 36, it says, but he saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then he said unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. See, when the harvest is ready, then there's a time for reaping. So when should we be reaping? Now. But the laborers are few. You know why? Because when, it, when you're doing hard work, and a lot of hard work, you have a tendency to want to faint. You have to either physically or mentally or both. And, and so what the Bible is telling us is the laborers refuse. says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. In other words, that we should be praying that more people come, not just to the church so that they can listen to good preaching, hard preaching on the word of God, but really so that we have more workers to do what the Lord has said that needs to be done. Go to Matthew 13, and we're going to go to verse 24. Matthew 13, 24, we're going to be looking at 24 through 30. And, uh, you know, we shall sow Jesus. Matthew uh, 13, 24, all the way to verse... Uh, 30 and it says another parable put he forward unto them saying the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field but while men slept his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way but when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit then appeared the tares also so the servants of the householder came and said unto him sir didst not thou sow good seed in thy field from whence then hath it tears. He said unto them, An enemy hath, hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together into the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in the bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then the Lord goes on, go down to verse 36, and he actually uh, explains this parable to the, the, uh, to the apostles. And in verse 36, he says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went, went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. And that word is capitalized. In other words, because we know God is man. I mean, Jesus Christ walked this earth as 100% man, 100% God, right? And he said, he that soweth the good seed. See, he set the example. And in verse 30, it says, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So even though we will be sowing and harvesting and reaping, there's a final sowing, I mean, there's a final harvesting and reaping that's coming, and the angels will be the reapers. It says in verse 40, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing 
and gnashing of teeth. And we know that that's talking about hell. And last week I spoke a little bit on heaven and hell, but that's the serious consequence. That's why when we go back, we see that God was moved by in compassion. It says in verse 30 and 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. You know, so the, the, the point is, you know, we shouldn't, let us not be weary and well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. If we faint not, but the thing that we have to do is we have to know what it is that we're doing. What's that well-doing? Well, if the Son of Man scattered the seed, and we are those, the product of the seeds, then we should be the ones scattering that seed, right? That's the well-doing. The well-doing is doing the work of the Lord. It's going out there and leading souls to Christ. And then, obviously, in the church is doing the work that the church requires. And, and what I mean by that is we need to be growing in the Word. We need to be preaching hard. We need to be uh, studying and encouraging others to read their Bibles all the way through and to correct their lifestyle. And we need to be willing to be chastised and to chastise, whether it's by other uh, brothers and sisters in Christ or by the Lord Himself. And then we need to be able to focus on those things, not... You know, and I'm not against church programs, but when church programs detract from the main thing, then they are uh, a stumbling block, and they should not be integrated. I would much rather have what most people would consider a boring church, but at least it's a church that's doing the work of the Lord, than a church that looks like it's a fun center, an entertainment center, but they're not doing anything for the Lord. You know, second is, you know, uh, let us... Let's go back, because I get excited, and then I get ahead of myself. But we shall reap what we sow. We shall sow Jesus. But also, Jesus commands us to sow to the Spirit. Go to Galatians 5.19. Galatians 5.19. So if you just turn over, you're in Galatians 6, where we had our, uh, uh, our, the scripture for our message. But if you go to Galatians 5, Galatians 5, and I, you know, I love this set of, of scripture, uh, for verses 19 through uh, 25. It says in Galatians 5, 19, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. And the reason that I focus on that is because Jesus commands us to sow the Spirit. And a lot of the, the, the new doctrine that's coming in, which makes sense as, the, as this one world order takes in, as we expect the Antichrist to come in, as we expect the mark of the beast, is that all religions and all faiths will have to believe in one God. But they're not going to believe in the one God of the Bible. They're going to believe in a God where they think they can be gods. And when you think like that, or when you think that you can control your destiny, that's a work. And the Bible says that works of the flesh, and they're manifest, it gives you some consequences. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told, as, as I have also told you in the time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the Bible is telling us that the works of the flesh lead to these things. They're manifest in this way. And look, it's real easy to know that this is actually true because we can pick on just a big religion just because it's been on the news uh, the last couple of weeks, actually for the, last, the better part of a month. You know, the Catholic religion has been on an onslaught of attacks, well-deserved, for abusing children. You know, having a bunch of pedophiles, having a bunch of reprobates running around doing wicked, unseemly things to the most innocent and precious thing that the Lord could give us, which is children. So let's look at verse... Uh, 22 and verse 22 says but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering gentleness goodness faith meekness temperance against such there is no law and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust and so see the fruit of the spirit it, you notice it's not the works of the spirit it's the fruit of the Spirit. See, the work's already been done by Jesus Christ. That's why we know that He's the original sower. In other words, if, if we have our faith and our, and our sight set on Jesus Christ, then we're not going to faint when it comes time to reap. 
See, most of the time why people give up on good programs, why most people give up on soul winning, why most people give up on going to church, why most people give up on reading their Bibles is because they're looking at their works and their works can be deceiving. The Bible says that we deceive ourselves. You know, it makes reference to that constantly. But if we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, then we can have love and we can have joy and we can have peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You know, when you go soul winning and the, they slam doors in your face and they tell you uh, mean things or they kick you out or they don't give you the time of day, how is it that you can endure with love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? Well, the way that you do that is because you have the fruit of the Spirit. So Jesus commands us to sow to the Spirit. See, when we're out there talking about the Word of God, you know, if we're not dealing with false uh, uh, prophets, if we're not dealing with what we would like in the equivalent of Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes of the day, then we have to sow to the, the Spirit. We have to tell them of Jesus Christ. We have to tell them of the death, burial, and resurrection, and that He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Him. And so the challenge is that the flesh can get in the way. And sometimes we might want to go soul winning just to see how many souls we can lead to Christ. Or we might come to church just so people know how much we come to church. Or we might tithe, we might tithe just so people know how much we tithe. If you're doing it for that, then it's the works of the flesh. But if you're doing things according to the Bible, then you're going to have the, the, the fruits of the Spirit. So, you know... We're going to reap what we sow, right? So we've talked about that. We shall reap what we sow. But then we're going to reap the same kind that we sow. And I spoke about that a little bit earlier. But you know what? So does the devil. The Proverbs 11:18 says, and while I'm doing that, you can turn to Hebrews uh, 6. Go to Hebrews 6, and we're going to be in Hebrews 6, 10. But in Proverbs 11:18 it says, The wicked worketh a deceitful work. But to him that soweth righteousness, notice it didn't say to him that worketh righteousness, to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. So the Bible tells us that whoever works wickedly, they do a deceitful work. In other words, they do a lying work. Any time that we get out of the, uh, the lanes, I mean, if, if, if that's a good descriptor, if we get out of the lanes that the Bible has given us in these 66 books, anytime we get out of that, we're sowing a deceitful work. I mean, even if it's just an opinion, I mean, if it's not God's word, if you can't back it up, you know what? If you disagree with something with the pastor that's preaching the word, if you disagree with me, check it with the word of God because we're going to reap to the same kind we sow, but sow with the devil. And we already saw that earlier, that concept that, you know, the tares are among the wheat and they're both going to be reaped at the end time, right? Right. And so let's look at the, the other concepts. This makes sowing and reaping the harvest hard work. Whenever we're, we're sowing to the same kind and we're dealing with the tares in there and the enemy putting it there, there's going to be extra work when it comes time to reap. And if you're not understanding what God's goals are, if you don't see what the Bible tells us, you know, what we've been talking about, you're going to get discouraged because you're like, what, what's the point? Why did I put in all this work if there's tares in the way? Why did I do all of this if, if people leave church? Why did I do all this if, if false, pro, uh, false prophets are going to come in? Why did I do all this if people are going to continue sinning? Why did I do this if people get rich and, and we're struggling? You know, and, and these are the things that you hear. I'm, I'm not necessarily complaining about that, but these are the things that are, are affecting people today. Well, if you go to Hebrews 6, verse 10, the Bible says, For God is not unrighteous to forget the, your work, and labor of love. See, now love has a labor. But see, it's first the spirit and then the labor. Not the other way around. See, when you depend on your works, there's never any spirit. Well, technically there is, right? A, a negative or evil spirit. But, but when you have the fruit of the spirit, Christ, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, then there is a labor of love. So let's look at Hebrews 6.10 again. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that every one of you, uh, one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, 
but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit promises. And we don't want to be slothful because once you get lazy, then it's really easy to faint. See, if you're not in condition to do the things that you do, if you're not constantly exercising uh, the spirit, if you're not constantly exercising your will, well, guess what? You're going to faint in those areas. So when temptation comes, if you're not praying to God and practicing and how to beat temptation and how to overcome temptation, what temptation is going to get in the way? So then when it comes to doing the work of the Lord, when it comes to going out there soul winning and you're tired and you're uh, discouraged or you just don't want to get there and do that, you, m you might not go. And then you don't get to reap the well-doing if you faint. And so we have to focus on the fact that when we sow and the reaping comes, the harvest is ready, there's going to be hard work. And, and honestly, it's double work. And I'm not talking even about all the work in between. Because you, when, you, when you prepare the land, or when, and, and in this, in this uh, context, when you're preparing the spirit, you're starting a new ministry, you're in a new town, or you're just rebuilding a ministry, you know, there's a lot of work. There's tilling the land, there's redoing stuff. Then you sow. Well, then what, you got to wait for the season to, to happen. Well, in that season, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but in that season, in between the harvesting and the reaping, there's work. You can't just twiddle your thumbs and wait around. You got to be prepared so that you know what to do when the when you have to harvest and you reap. Go to Proverbs, I mean, go to John 4, but uh, go to John 4, but in the meantime, I'll read to you uh, Proverbs 22, 8. He says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail. So and the reason I just threw that in there is I just want to make sure that you guys know uh, sowing occurs on both sides, on the side of evil and on the side of good. And there's going to be uh, a consequence for that, which is eternal hell. But also for us it, you know, that are saved, you know, it's not required. Salvation is, work is not required for salvation, but work is required for rewards and for getting the kingdom expanded for doing the work of the Lord. So there is a possibility to sow an iniquity, and then we're going to reap to vanity. And the rod of his anger shall fail. Go to John 4, verse 35. It says, Say not ye, there are four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And here is that saying, O oh, true, one soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon, whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. And so the Bible is telling you, look, there's no excuse. Because even if you don't know how to get something started, the Bible is telling us that we're going to run into other people's labor. And we will be able to take advantage of that and reap some of those rewards. And a great example of that is, you know, when I got saved, I was 25 years old. It was 2005. I remember the, the day and the time, February 15th. And, you know, one of these days I'll bring a message on, you know, just how I got saved because I didn't, you know, a lot of these preachers that are, that I respect and, and I learn from, including Pastor Cobb. Pastor Cobb, uh, you know, went into the ministry at a very young age. To, uh, just yesterday, he turned 82 years old. And he's still bringing the message hard. He's still preaching. He's still young and spry and ready to go. But he's been preaching for a long time. And one of the things that, that I learned is, you know, that you get to, to reap some of that labor. You get to reap some of that reward. You get to look at some of that stuff. And some of these guys that, that I respect and admire, you know, and I've gone to their conferences. And by the way, let me make a, a, a side note here. Pastor Cobb, uh, he's my pastor. He's the guy who ordained me. And he, I keep him abreast of, anything, of everything because he's my leader, and I'm not here to cause dissension but to grow and edify the church. And so he's completely behind everything that we're doing. So going back to the reason that I say that is because, you know, when I got saved at 25, I was taught the Romans Road by my mentor or friend. But the way that I was taught to soul win was just one-on-one. -on -one. Just talk to everybody, and, and you should. You shouldn't just go on your soul winning times, but you should just be soul winning every day all the time because that's the most important thing. But one of the things that, that was really difficult was that it's easy to faint that way because there's times where you can go months without leading a soul to Christ. You know, and, and when you finally look at the end of the year, you've only led a handful of people to Christ. 
And the reason that that is is because there's not a set time, there's not a set structure, there's not a, you know, a, and, and, you're, and there's not a lot of the law of large numbers, right? You're not going out there knocking doors. You're not talking to hundreds of people or thousands of people in a year. So it just makes sense that when you're doing that, you're going to reap more rewards. And, and so one of the things that I've just been paying attention to is over the last couple of years, there's been this resurgence, this group, this movement, uh, and they call, it's called the new IFB movement. I say they, I, I, I guess I'm part of that movement. I shouldn't, I don't, because there's no membership. It's just a group of young people or young generation that's willing to go out there and do the work of the Lord and stick to the principles that are in the Bible biblically, regardless of what the old uh, guard has said. And by the way, my pastor's not of the old guard. He's just been preaching what's been, pre been preached for a long time. That's why I uh, learned from Pastor Cobb. And that's why he's supportive of our soul winning efforts. But long story short, we started our soul winning here, our soul winning weekly and going out door to door in November of last year, 2017. And the way that, that came about is I saw the uh, announcement for the soul winning mega marathon. And I told the pastor, I said, hey, you know, uh, there's this pastor in Arizona and they're going to lead this worldwide event. His name is Steven Anderson or Pastor Steven Anderson. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like our church to participate. He said, whatever you need, you got my support 100%. So then I made phone calls, and I got in touch with some of the other pastors here in Texas. And then people started showing up. And what we started doing was just started to soul win. And I remember one of the first things, and this is just experience from reading my word, and also from just business in general and life, is that there's always excitement when something new is coming around. But what I told Th those individuals then and I tell anybody here today is that it's not about the excitement today it's about what you'll be doing tomorrow uh, next week a month from now a year from now two years from now three years from now and the one thing that I but the wor where I want to focus on is that we here at this church we I sent you to reap whereon ye bestowed no labor we were able to reap from the labor that was started 12 years ago in a little church in Tempe, Arizona. Other men labored, and ye entered into their labors. So see, there's no excuse for not doing the work of the Lord because other people have laid the groundwork so that you can go out there and do the work, and then you can then turn around and do the same for those following behind. So the bottom line is stop making excuses. And when you make excuses, guess what? You're in danger of fainting. And then you won't be able to gather when it's time to reap, right? And the Bible is telling us that clearly, you know, if we look back, it says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we say faint not. In due season, look, I didn't go so winning like I'm doing now for the first 13 years of my saved life. 12, 13 years, I mean, I don't know, add a, a, a few months there or not, that's not exact. But I stayed in the Word, and I continued to grow, and so spiritually, individually, I'm reaping what I sowed, but more than that, I've also walked into the labors. It says, other men labored, and ye, I've entered into the labor of other men. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Let's see what the Bible also says. What, what are the things that we need to be careful for? 1 Corinthians 3, 5 it says, you know, the sowing and the reaping is hard work, and we have to sow to our kind. It says, when, who then is Paul, and who is Apollo, Apollos? But ministers of whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Another danger is we have to sow to our own kind. Well, how do we sow to our own kind? When we remove our egos, when we remove what we think we need to do or accomplish, and when we just do the work and let God give the increase. The Bible says, so then neither, verse 7, is he that planteth anything, neither he that watered but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husband, husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon, and meaning, how, how are we going to uh, organize? How are we going to plan? God wants us to be 
do things decently and in order. And verse 11 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And so the Bible, if you see this, he talks about labor a couple of times. And he's talking about removing ourselves so that we don't think ourselves anything, but that God gives the increase. And that's how we sow after our own kind. You can tell other ministries, other people when they're sowing after their kind because you can see God behind it. How do you do that? Well, you screw you. Uh, you search it in the scriptures, right? If they're having tribulation, if they're having persecution, but they're reaping fruit, if they're growing in the word under such duress, if they're under fiery trials, these are things that are important for going out there and sowing after your own kind. And also, it's really good so that when you see other ministries grow that don't look like yours, and you wonder, are they doing the work of the Lord? Then you remember that there's also tares among the wheat. And if you studied anything about tares and wheat, the tares don't look that much different from the wheat. See, sometimes these other religions or these other false religions, they don't look or sound that much different until you really get into the word, until you really pick them and you start to look at the grains and realize one's different than the other. See, a lot of people will say, yes, I'm saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Great. Can you lose your salvation? Yes. Well, that's not the wheat. That's the tear. And we need to make sure that that's a clear foundation that is established. We need to clear that up for people. So, you know, we need to reap after our own kind. So we need to sow our own kind. Well, how do you sow your own kind? We sow God's word, especially for us. It's the King James. And actually, I've been doing a lot of studying because it was recommended to me. And for the Spanish-speaking people, it's the Reina Valera Gomez. For anybody who's listening that, that's wondering what a, what's a good version, Reina Valera Gomez. Now, there's a debate. I'm not going to get into that of other versions, but I would not touch anything uh, from 1960 on in the Spanish versions. But definitely, if you can just avoid all of it, get the Reina Valera Gomez. That's a good version for the Spanish-speaking people. It's a preserved word of God. But... Uh, Let's go on to uh, our, our, our next point, which is we reap in a different season than we sow, and we're always going to sow more than we reap. We reap in a different season, and it's always more than what we sow. So let's just take a look. We shall reap what we sow, right? And then we reap after the same kind that we sow, but so does the devil. So remember, it's not just the sowing, but what kind of sowing we're doing. And then we reap in a different season than we sow, but we're always going to reap more than what we sow. And, and a quick example of that before I get into the, uh, uh, the points, you know, I, I want to use one biblical example, but then I also want to just give you, you know, a good way to know that that's actually true besides just reading the scripture, but seeing God's handiwork in nature, like the Bible says, is, you know, just, just take a fruit or take anything. So I just looked up corn because, you know, corn is one of those things that you can Google and there's more information you want to know because a bunch of things come from corn. But, you know, a cob of corn, just one cob of corn contains between 500 and 1,200 kernels, depending on the type of corn. I didn't even know there were so many types of corns. And about, and one stalk uh, contains about two years, two to three years of corn. So you're talking anywhere between 1,000 and 2,400 kernels of corn from one seed. So see, you plant one seed and you're getting thousands and thousands of percentages higher than what you planted. And that's where we really have to focus. That's where the difference is, right? Sometimes we want the instant gratification. See, that corn didn't grow overnight. That seed wasn't planted. It didn't die immediately. It died and then it had to be reborn and then it became a, a stalk of corn and then it had years and then it, was, it, it gave the fruit. But the challenge is that today's society with all the, the media, you know, my phone's right here. I'm not, the phone's right there. I just have it for the time. But the phone is a distraction. The television is a distraction. The sports are a distraction. The church is a distraction. The friends and family are a distraction. Everything's a distraction. The worst part is not just that it's a distraction. It's a distraction because everything's like that. Everybody gets everything like that. So we haven't learned to wait on the Lord. We haven't to learned to wait for things. Things just come. And guess what? They're not that good when they come like that. You know, a good example of that is if you go eat uh, at a fast food restaurant, the food's like, uh, okay, I mean, I guess if you're hungry and you really need to eat, you know, I guess at the, for us here in Texas, the best fast food is like Whataburger. But I'm going to tell you that if I go 
and get a burger at the grocery store and I turn on my grill and I wait for it to heat up and I put the spices and the I slice up the jalapenos and put them in there and I get all the meat ready and I get all the, the sides ready and I get the bread ready and all the chips that I want and you know the coke uh, as a reward because I you know it's one of the things that I don't like to drink anymore but every once in a while I just like a good ice cold coke that's much better than going to get a water burger but I have it takes time it takes time to get to that level right so we're going to reap a bigger reward if we put a lot more time into it and we're going to reap a lot more than what we thought.